Jen. So give me just a second. Yes, there we go. We're ready. It's all you. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So I guess what I had in mind is to present a little bit of a like research vignette. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I don't care if I like get through this in some sense. Um, but it, I, I guess I would like to kind of make a point about how the state of practice can differ quite a bit from the um, state of research. And so I'll give you a peek into that, um, a kind of, well, the primary application that I'm going to look at is in solid mechanics or more generally what we call elliptic equations. So these are used a lot in engineering. If you've ever heard of like uh, computer assisted engineering, uh, finite element analysis, um, these are, uh, oh, that's to everybody else. You can probably see my video <laughs> um, at this point and I am on a wired connection. Um, so yeah, at a high level, one of the key factors that distinguishes a lot of research from a lot of practice is that constants actually matter a lot because constants affect what is your bottleneck? What is the limiting factor? And in practice, as we choose what computational methods and what things to build in the real world, um, we're constantly dealing with trade-offs and constants affect where we land on those trade-off curves. So in high-performance computing, we care a lot about, say, the relative cost of compute versus moving memory around. And if you're limited by moving memory around, then optimizations that improve compute maybe don't impact you. And if you shift the algorithm in some way, perhaps you land in a regime where now you're limited by compute. Um, so in the cartoon over here on the right, these are uh, kind of a, a vague sense of different algorithms or application areas and maybe where they land on this diagram. Um, so another is looking at latency versus throughput. In some applications, you have a rather small amount of work that needs to be done between data dependencies or rounds of communication. And so you may care a lot about latency, but it, not about the, say, total bandwidth. Um, in my world, we're often trying to uh, simulate or approximate physical systems of various sorts. And there are always tolerances because there's always uncertainties kind of throughout that. There is an uncertainty in going between a set of physical equations, uh, like continuum equations, and discrete models that we can actually code up that have a finite amount of state instead of infinite size state. Um, we can only fit finitely much in a computer. We can only do finitely many operations. Um, there's also that set of continuum equations doesn't perfectly match reality. So it, there are approximations all along the way. And um, what quantities we want to be able to accurately predict may depend a lot on the application. Why are you setting up and running this simulation? Even if it's the same physical system, you may do it for different reasons. So an example of that would be, say, within the room, say we want to model air within the room that we are in. Um, there are acoustic waves, that's like my speaking, um, that travels through the air, but there's also, say, the heating system. And so if you care about heat transport, then you maybe don't care about acoustics. And if you care about acoustics, it's a really different time scale. Even though the physical system is the same, it's still the air in the room, you're asking a different question. And so what you want to be able to accurately predict changes. Um, so let's take a peek into solid mechanics. Um, now, we, you may not be familiar with terms here like finite elements and order of the element. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, there is an industrial state of practice. It uses small, simple elements. Um, we call those low order. And it uses a set of algorithms and data structures that are based on assembled matrices. So you tend to work with 
um, what we call sparse matrices. So they have lots of entries that are zero. In fact, most of the entries in these large matrices are zero, but the matrices may have dimension of like million by a million or billion by a billion. And um, so they use data structures that explicitly represent the entries that are non-zero. And there's a couple of myths, I would say, um, that say high order elements, which are basically larger elements that are more complicated inside. Um, they're not going to help because these real problems have what we call singularities. And another is that matrix free methods are really just meant for really high order problems for high order discretizations. Um, so matrix free methods are ways in which we can avoid forming these sparse matrices. It's a different set of data structures one that at least at first glance seems much more repellent to clean abstractions and libraries. Um, I'm here to argue that that's it, not really true. Um, of course, myths wouldn't be useful if they didn't have a bit of truth to them. And so the reality is industrial models are just completely full of singularities. They're full of these corners or um, say contact, different kinds of boundary conditions, and all of those produce singularities. And so in practice, you take an equation um, and around all those corners, you're gonna end up with these infinite slopes. Um, so the derivatives of the solution go to infinity near those corners. And it's just a general property of systems um, like the potential equation in electromagnetics, um, a steady state heat equation, elasticity, like in solid mechanics. Um, and there has been uh, an applied mathematics technique called HP adaptivity. And it's kind of sophisticated to implement, but this technique was kind of the foundations were laid in the 80s and applied mathematicians have worked on these methods over the intervening decades. And if you ask an applied mathematician about this, then it, the clear way to deal with this problem is to use this um, family of methods that allows you to vary the order of accuracy of the element um, and you kind of simultaneously adapt in the size of the element and the complexity of what goes inside of each element. And that allows you to have convergence diagrams. Um, so this is snapped from a paper, but the Y axis here is the error and the X axis is like the number of degrees of freedom in the problem, the, the size of the problem in a sense. Um, and so they give you much better slopes and in fact, qualitatively, uh, better performance on these kind of curves. So how do those methods work? Well, you have this sequence of refinements and the darker colored elements here are the um, high order elements. They're the ones that have a lot of complexity inside and the lighter color are simple elements. That's where apparently it's easy to approximate the solution. And so there's all this kind of structure. But if you look at how engineers actually design widgets of whatever sort, um, they tend to use much coarser meshes. There just isn't room to have all of that refinement. And so you end up with meshes that look much more like this. And they use linear elements, the simplest elements they can get away with. And so we might wonder, well, what is more efficient? And so we end up with diagrams that look like this, where we've got error versus number of degrees of freedom. And there's, a, on this kind of diagram, you kind of want to be in the lower left corner. Um, that would be the, the best place to be. It would be very cheap and very accurate. Um, the methods that get closest to that are what we call the Pareto front. Um, so like these, uh, these blue points over here, and this is coming not from creating more small elements, but just creating richer, um, somewhat higher order elements. We call that P refinement. It turns out to get this right, 
you have to also improve the approximation of the geometry. So if you work with linear geometry, um, then it actually doesn't work at all to do this kind of refinement. The industry standard practices on this kind of diagram um, would look like linking up these uh, kind of gold circles. Now, all the lines on this curve have the same slope, all of these like H refinement lines. And so a lot of mathematicians would say, ah, there's no, there's no point. This is, um, it's too slow. There are methods that converge asymptotically faster. The issue is an engineering tolerance is gonna come along at a value like this. Um, so it, there isn't a need to solve this equation to eight digits of accuracy, for example. Um, we only need to solve it to two digits of accuracy. And so we, you're going to be working on a coarse grid, and that's why engineers tend to work on these coarser grids and use very simple elements. On the other hand, even if we were to pick an accuracy tolerance, say like 10 to the minus 2, there's still about an order of magnitude reduction in the number of degrees of freedom that's needed to achieve that tolerance. So why isn't this the industry standard practice? The primary reason for it is the data structures that they have chosen, these sparse matrices, cause these uh, Xs here, the second order methods, to be a lot more expensive per degree of freedom than these gold circles, the linear elements. And so that's where some of the research in our group has come in. Um, it turns out that on modern hardware, if you say, how much does it cost per byte? Uh, like, sorry, how many flops can you perform per byte? Um, and this is over the past uh, decade plus. So on this diagram, the number of flops you can perform per byte you can transfer from memory has been steadily increasing. And on basically every kind of hardware today, you can do at least 10 floating point operations per byte that you transfer. Now, um, these are double precision floating point operations. So um, it's a similar picture, different numbers for single precision. Double precision is eight bytes. So roughly speaking, you can do 80 floating point operations. So that's like additions and multiplications for the cost of loading one floating point value from memory. Now, this means when we think about how expensive some computation is for a lot of computations, the vast majority of what we encounter in scientific computing, we should be thinking about how much data we have to transfer and not so much about how many floating point operations we have to do. So if you go into that regime, um, yeah, let me fit everything on. Um, so if you go into that regime, it turns out it accurately predicts the cost to say multiply a sparse matrix times a vector. And if you use the standard data structures, so this is like the industry standard approach using linear elements. Um, this is running on GPUs. It's using the vendor libraries. The performance model that's based purely on data transfer sets a ceiling right about here. So if all you're doing is, memory, is uh, kind of checking how much memory are we transferring and what is the theoretical peak bandwidth of this device, you very nearly achieve it using this, these standard data structures. And if you go from linear elements to quadratic elements, we see this drop in performance and it's completely explained by the fact that every row in the matrix um, using the quadratic elements has about two and a half times as many non-zero entries. So you see this substantial reduction in performance. If instead you use these matrix-free data structures that we've been building libraries for and algorithms that work with and kind of solving these solid mechanics problems, 
then the cost, even for linear elements, um, is reduced by about a factor of two. So the efficiency is improved uh, by double. Um, and as you go from linear elements to quadratic elements, the performance almost doubles again. So these methods, as you go to high order, they become cheaper per degree of freedom. And so in fact, that diagram we were looking at was generous to the high order. Sorry, it was uh, this one. It was kind of generous to the low order methods because the low order methods with our data structures, which are faster than the industry standard data structures, um, still cost a lot more for these linear elements. And the quadratic elements here um, cost proportionally less per degree of freedom. So if we were to try to replace this x-axis instead of saying total number of degrees of freedom, instead we said cost, like how much time does it take or how much energy does it take to compute? What you would see is that these high order points would kind of slide over to the left and the low order points would slide over to the right. Um, and so there's even a stronger preference for um, these kind of the methods over here. All right, so in solid mechanics, we have to actually solve a linear system. And it, in fact, a nonlinear system. So solving the nonlinear system involves a sequence of linear systems that have to get solved. And those linear systems are very big. Um, so the matrices are of dimension million or billions. And we do that using some algorithms called uh, multigrid. Um, and it, there's a algorithm that kind of takes advantage of the element structure um, called P multigrid. And then we move to what's called algebraic multigrid on these coarse grids. And basically there's a lot of ways to reuse data and to organize the computation in a way that it's actually flexible and easy for people to develop when they're not specialists in these solvers. And it turns out that that's really important. Um, so if we look at solve efficiencies, so this is something as an analyst, like if your day job is um, engineering design of uh, of structures, whether it's like cranes or uh, tractors or airplanes, but it, you're designing structures, um, you're going to be changing geometry, you're going to be changing material, you're going to be experimenting with different loading conditions. And so you're going to say, basically, how efficient is my simulation? And how long do I have to wait? So you have a choice, you could like run a parallel job across more nodes of a cluster or cloud instance. Um, or you could run, say, on a workstation, and maybe you have to wait a little bit longer. Um, anyway, we've explored a, a bunch of um, GPU-based clusters and that kind of scaling. And we get these diagrams. So there's kind of a, if you want to run either if you want to get a solution fast, you're going to sacrifice some amount of efficiency. If you can wait a little bit longer and load up memory, then you can amortize some of that latency. Um, and so anyway, we get these kinds of trade-off diagrams. Um, and the numbers here are a lot better. Um, in many cases, an order of magnitude or more better than what you would get using standard data structures. That's what more or less everybody in industry is using right now. Now, a lot of people doing engineering solid mechanics um, solve rather small problems, but there is still a sizable number of people and number of companies that run very large problems. Um, it turns out on different architectures, different uh, phases of the solve are the bottlenecks. So the black lines here are and on the previous slide you could see like the black and the gold lines are very close to each other 
over here, the block lines are much better. So we get much higher efficiency. This is running on an, a machine based on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, it turns out that phase is significantly faster on that architecture. Well, this other important phase called setup is significantly faster on the AMD GPUs. Um, and it, this is representative of this uh, new machine called Frontier. That's the uh, like the new number one in the world supercomputer. Um, anyway, it's it, it's this architecture, um, and so some phases are much faster. And so, depending on what architecture you are on, this say factor of two difference in efficiency, it may cause you to. Uh, adjust your algorithm in a way such that you do the cheap thing more often um, and the expensive thing less often. Um, so we, we can compare back to some historical kind of grand challenge computations. Um, and in supercomputing, there's this award called the Gordon Bell Prize. Um, it's a uh, I, it's something lots of people compete for. Um, and in 2002 and 2004, there were Gordon Bell Prizes. They were solving problems of similar scale to what we solve today um, in a few seconds on one node. So it has multiple GPUs, but it's a one node computer. What these were running on at the time was the largest machine of the day. Um, that one node is actually only slightly more powerful than in terms of its peak like theoretical peak performance than the, uh, these top supercomputers of when these awards were given. So kind of today's one node computing um, has say similar theoretical peak to uh, the, these full machines of what were the top supercomputers of that day. Um, but Instead of taking a few minutes to solve, we take a few seconds to solve, and we can use these elements that are actually more accurate. And so if you had kept the same algorithms from that time, it would, um, it, well, for one, it would still be slower today instead of being significantly faster. Um, and you would need a significantly bigger computer than one node of today. Um, anyway, it's an interesting comparison. So all this kind of work, it depends on numerical libraries. And one example of a library here, one that our group has taken the lead on developing, uh, is a package called libseed. And it, the intent of this package is to provide fast algebra for element-based discretizations, but not to be another finite element framework. So really, we wanted some code that lots of existing legacy code that has all kinds of uh, cool custom features in it would be able to use this package, get high performance running on CPUs and GPUs, sort of move on to these new set of data structures and the opportunities that that provides without having to kind of build up from scratch or um, adopt some intrusive framework. Uh, so we, we use these kind of conceptual abstractions. Um, I think maybe I won't dive into this unless there's questions. Um, an important bit here is in finite element analysis and broader modeling of PDEs, we can write these kind of uh, general abstractions, but it, some people in our community are say material scientists and everything they do lives within a function down here. So they're working on properties of materials, like um, how do granular materials fracture? And all of that can go into, uh, in fact, a small subset of, uh, or, or a kind of function that would be called inside of the code you would write for these, say, F0 and F1. At a different end of the spectrum, you have educators who are trying to teach about, say, canonical equations. 
And in that case, the equations that go in the box here are nice, simple one-liners that it, there's kind of never been any research on what goes in there. There's, it's kind of simple and linear and uh, very well understood, like what gives well posedness. And so, um, so, so we don't think about it very much. And we spend our time thinking about, um, you know, much kind of the outer abstractions. Um, anyway, for the people who kind of live down there in those pieces, they would like to have some performance transparency. They want to be able to have access to debuggers. Um, in many cases, they'll be calling out to old, like to legacy code, to tabulated material properties, um, all, all kinds of things that mess up domain specific languages. Um, and so there's a lot of benefit in being able to just work with a normal language um, and kind of have good debugging support. Um, anyway, to kind of summarize here, there is an old performance model where we use either iterative solvers, everything is limited by memory bandwidth, um, and you can kind of can't do any better than the the kind of standard data structures here. This uh, one over six, so one flop per six bytes, um, it makes it so that you're limited to usually less than 2% of the theoretical peak. On the other hand, there's something called direct solvers, and it, those can be compute limited, but they're also uh, completely intractable for very large problems. In the new performance model, we are still mostly limited by memory bandwidth, but much less so. And the overall performance ends up being a lot better. And um, there's kind of interesting things that need to be done in terms of kernel fusion and optimization strategies to make it work well across a lot of different architectures. Um, but we've done a lot of that work and uh, it does work remarkably well across a lot of applications. If you pick up a textbook on solid mechanics, it may uh, formulate the equations in kind of one way over here, or it can formulate the equations in a, uh, well, in a sort of equivalent way in, we, we call these initial and current configuration. And there's a linearization of those that you can do in a textbook, you will frequently not see a strong opinion about which you should use where. It turns out there is a rather significant performance consequence to where you choose to formulate, and it affects what you choose as the abstractions. Moreover, if you pick up a textbook, you're going to get equations that end up looking like this. And in this case, when we do small deformations, the matrix C and thus C inverse becomes pretty close to the identity. There ends up being a lot of cancellation here. And if you numerically evaluate, so this is evaluating a thing we call stress from these quantities that uh, quantify how much deformation has taken place, then you get an accuracy like this blue curve over on the right where for small strains, you lose a lot of accuracy. If you rewrite things in a slightly different way, um, and this is something that is also maybe surprisingly not discussed in any textbooks, um, and it's not implemented in any of the open source packages that we've been able to find, and even the commercial packages to the extent which we can do this experiment, they are also on the blue line up here, having an unstable formulation. Um, a small rearrangement of the way that you express the model can give you uh, accuracy to what we call machine precision. So for uh, single precision, that's the red line here for double precision. It's this uh, down here. And so it turns out there are places where if you're interested in the math, say people doing continuum mechanics from a 
continuum perspective, um, they will write down equations frequently that are unstable. And as a numerical analyst, we can come along and say, ah, well, we're going to rearrange these things a little bit. And even in these really mature, well-developed fields like finite strain solid mechanics, it turns out there's new stuff there. Um, and in some cases, it's a pretty elegant rearrangement that it allows you to get several digits more accuracy. And in many cases, that'll make it so that you can move from needing to use double precision, which is the industry standard approach, to being able to use single precision, which cuts your data size in half. And so that can also offer a significant performance boost. Um, anyway, there's a lot of implications here. It kind of moves through the entire uh, analysis pipeline from how you model the problem, how you create a mesh. Um, so most of solid mechanics is done using mesh-based methods. Um, and so you need to model geometry and create meshes, um, apply boundary conditions, run simulations. And when the cost landscape changes as much as we're considering here, um, it really changes those trade-offs and like the whole pipeline. Um, anyway, lots of neat stuff there. Um, I think I can kind of wrap up. Hopefully you have questions here. Um, so our group is involved in a lot of other activities um, from simulation of bonded granular media, um, simulation of processes in additive manufacturing, fast algorithms and community software. So this is more like an applied math and uh, numerical libraries uh, approach to things. Um, simulation of compound flooding. This is something that I will be looking for students on because it's a, a new project. So compound flooding is when you have storm surge, like in a hurricane. So ocean water comes inland because the sea level effectively rises, um, say, two meters often um, in a hurricane. So all this ocean water washes inland, but you also have heavy rains. And so there's a bunch of fresh water flowing out. And we want to understand this both from a hazard response perspective and from a long-term sustainability. So for example, if you have a bunch of crops that get inundated with seawater, you may not be able to grow those crops there anymore because it deposits a lot of salt. And so we want to identify regions that are at risk for storm surge. Um, and in particularly in the presence of compound flooding. Um, so that we can have some food security. Um, efficient simulation of uh, all sorts of problems, um, but one that we've been putting a, a bit of effort into recently is compressible turbulent flows. Um, Model-based inference. So say if you have a video of a piece of metal breaking, can we look at that video and turn it into the material properties so that we can accurately predict how other um, items manufactured from that kind of material would fail. Um, so it, this is kind of strong generalization. There's a lot of applications of this sort of model-based inference. The cartoon over on the right, and I'll be a little bit provocative, but I'm going to claim machine learning is a social term. It's not a technical term. So it, there are a lot of methods for making inferences. Um, a lot of those use what would be considered classical techniques. Um, you'll see terms like data assimilation. Um, some people will say, oh yeah, all that stuff that people have been doing for decades under other names is machine learning. Other people will say, no, it's not because it doesn't have this or that characteristic. Um, at the end of the day, I think this is really a social term and there's a continuum and there is a lot of benefit from kind of, instead of trying to draw lines through 
what do we uh, call these <laughs> um, different techniques? I think uh, we can uh, w work more broadly in this space of where can we use more understanding of a mechanism um, and where is the thing that's limiting us, say, the way in which we're using data. Um, and it, really, that's a, that's a continuum and the term isn't particularly meaningful in a technical sense. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I should stop talking. Um, and it, hopefully there's some questions. Uh, so. Thank you, Ted. Anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question, but a lot of things went over my head, but maybe my question may sound so dumb, but yeah, because it is the first time I'm hearing all this, a lot of mechanical terms and such. And I'm also sorry for my camera quality, because I don't know why manufacturers like to put a VJ camera, even in 2019 models, but very sorry for that. Uh, so my question is on, uh, why are we trying to move away from uh, the matrix computations? Like if matrix computation is heavy on current CPU architectures, like uh, I, why can't we use some kind of hardware accelerations for like writing better uh, ALUs that can handle matrix better? I mean, like rather than shifting the whole, doing all the circus of converting this matrix into another higher order equations to solve. I'm like, easy. I'm like, I thought like manufacturing, I'm like, my whole idea is like, why can't we build a better hardware for, uh, or is our current algorithms uh, tested against these kind of hardware? Uh, hardware accelerated for matrix multiplications. I, I I think I remember reading some papers regarding this matrix multiplication because I was reading a paper which was trying to predict the tsunami analysis in uh, India once tsunami hit in 2004. So they tried uh, building larger matrices and they tried bringing in this hardware. In, they were trying to run in an, a supercomputer in IAC, uh, but that was a lot. So they tried uh, reducing this, uh, bringing some new hardware of such kind which can uh, accelerate these matrices uh, computations and such. So as you said that there was some there was some kind of latencies and conversion of that uh, matrix such. So why aren't we trying to progress in that? Yeah, totally. It's a it's a great question. Um, so what we're dealing with here is matrix vector products or really solving linear systems. So say AX equals B, where A is a matrix, say of dimension billion by a billion. We can't store that directly. So that's like exabytes of data. Um, there's no machine where we can just store a whole bunch of exabytes of data. Um, not in memory, not even on disk. Um, it's just like not a tractable amount. And yet on a couple of GPU equipped nodes, we can solve those linear systems within a few seconds. Okay. Um, now to do that, we, um, we have to use sparse matrices and techniques called preconditioning. Um, those end up boiling down to operations that either are sparse matrix vector products or something with almost the same computational structure. Okay. Um, for anything like that, we're limited by the cost to move the data around. So the energy cost, I kind of gave these like, how is modern hardware balanced? But the energy cost with any way that you can design your hardware, it costs about a hundred times as much to move that data into a register than it is to do the computation once it's in the register. So all of these kinds of operations are limited by that memory transfer. And most of the silicon for GPUs and CPUs is 
um, related to moving the memory around. We've gotten really good at making those floating point units. Um, and uh, like you could go from say 40 or 50% of the die area dedicated to moving memory around to like 98% dedicated to moving memory around. Um, and you wouldn't get that much benefit, you know, perhaps 2x more bandwidth. Um, so like bandwidth is expensive and the limiting factor is physics and cost. Um, and so we really want data structures that don't have to move so much memory around. Now, if you were doing dense matrix matrix products, and in fact, some of what we do ends up turning these sparse operations, these like conceptually sparse things into very small dense operations. The problem is they tend to be so small that they're still limp and those computations are so fast that we're still at the end of the day limited by the memory bandwidth. Um, but it, if you have applications that um, really have this high arithmetic intensity, lots of that dense computation, it turns out that's what GPUs especially and the SIMD units on CPUs as well to a large extent were made for. So like tensor cores on GPUs, um, TPUs if you like, um, lots of the specialized hardware, it has hardware instructions that perform small matrix matrix products in like a single instruction. It is done through micro operations, but um, I, anyway, the, the hardware is basically already built for that purpose. Um, so maybe you can make it a little better in some settings, but it's already pretty well constructed for doing that kind of mm -hmm. matrix math. Um, and that's motivated by a lot of application demands. Um, you're still going to be limited on every one of those architectures by memory bandwidth. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think uh, Singwook Lee has added some chat questions. Yeah, so th there was there was certainly a lot going on, um, and uh, I, I don't expect everybody in this room to uh, like have a background in solid mechanics. Um, so broadly speaking, our work is saying how can we make the solid mechanics engineering users um, happier. So can we make it cheaper for them to do analysis? Can we make it so that instead of submitting a batch job overnight, they can run their job on a workstation? Can we make it so that instead of doing that batch job that goes overnight, we can make it so that it's something that's interactive where they can update parameters and get results within seconds or a couple of minutes instead of hours? Um, can we make it so that they can put an optimization loop around? So instead of the human thinking about the results, they can set up a metric of like, what does it mean to be successful? Either that's say matching data or that's, um, making the lightest structure that performs within safety tolerances across a bunch of different loading regimes. Um, and then have a numerical optimizer run this code or construct a surrogate and explore that surrogate so that we can better quantify uncertainties and uh, design better parts. Um, added manufacturing is really interesting in this space because you can 3D print any structure you like. It doesn't like have to be a special shape um, doesn't have to be something that's like easily millable with um, kind of classic manufacturing techniques. And so it opens up this design space, but it, you still got to explore that design space. 
Um, it, it, anyway, our goal is to make these workflows efficient, also to make it so that, say, material scientists can design their new material models and test and calibrate them faster from data that is readily accessible. Um, so it's expensive to say, manufacture lots of prototypes with a certain material, run them through various experiments with impacts and imaging and analyze the results from that. Um, what if we could do many fewer experiments and yet we could still reliably calibrate? That may take uh, better quality simulation and fast simulation of the forward model. Um, the ability to evaluate gradients that pass through the forward model. Um, so uh, basically in our group, we are trying to create tools that will be reusable, um, that will help domain scientists. We collaborate heavily both within the like computational science um, or computational methods world. Um, so other people who develop say software packages that we use or that use our tools or that do similar things and we set up benchmark problems and compare. Um, and then say with the domain scientists who have applications and they wanna be able to do certain kinds of simulations more efficiently or they wanna do new simulations that haven't been done before. And to get there, we have to um, kind of become familiar enough with their values and their terminology, the, the kind of language and approach that they're taking and design the software that fills that role. Um, a really neat thing about this space is it can be really heavily leveraged. So if you put things into a software package that's at the right level of abstraction, um, you can really help like thousands of research groups to run more efficient simulations or to, um, and it, they're all gonna be running in them for their own science or engineering purposes. Um, industry also uses this kind of software a lot. So one library that, um, th that I worked on a lot and our group contributes to is called Petsy. Um, and it's used by a lot of commercial software, both uh, in-house simulation and other like vendors of engineering software. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, I've shown some diagrams of like, ways that we present that data or comparisons that we make. But anyway, yeah, th thanks a lot for that question. And I see Layla and Resgar over in the, um, the, the participants here. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to answer more questions about this. Um, so they, they've both been working in, in our group um, and have put familiarity with lots of these things. So Jed, if master's students were interested in working with your team, would they reach out to you or to your PhD students? Either way, yeah. Um, another place where there's certainly opportunities is in making these kinds of tools more accessible. So for example, one thing that one thing I'm interested in, because I would like to make it easier to use these tools in the classroom, is I would really love for these um, tools to work in a browser, like using WebAssembly. And we can compile them for that environment, but we haven't like developed demos. Um, we haven't done performance experiments. It's kind of, it, it's an early stage. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of research that is actually not super performance sensitive, 
but it, it kind of needs to be convenient. And it, then there's on the education side, saving the install and just kind of the sorts of things that HPC people love to think about and the rest of the world hates to think about um, <laughs> can, can save a lot. And so th there's, I, I think a lot of opportunities for integration, um, whether it's kind of web oriented or education oriented. Um, and it, th these are a place, if you have a little bit of experience in those realms um, or you just kind of want to get your feet wet in this topic, um, creating kind of demos or you know, like a little educational module um, would be a really clear value and uh, would give you the experience to decide if you want to kind of get in deeper in how does that algorithm work? Um, like really under the hood, I want to like, can, can we find a better way to do that thing? Um, so anyway, just wanted to put that out. Okay, so it seems like we ran out of questions for now at least. So if you guys have questions in the future, Leila has put her email on the chat. Feel free to reach out to her or to Jed. And thank you so much, Jed, again, once again, for your time and the presentation. We'll be posting this on our uh, website as well for prospective students to watch it. Thank you once again. All right, Everybody fantastic. have thank a you. great weekend.